Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 tonight, or today rather, of course, is Veterans Day. And uh, Sunday morning we uh, honored our veterans, had a good number of veterans here. And uh, we were able to give all of them a gift. That was a blessing. And I really appreciate our veterans. And uh, Sunday we talked about duty and how as a Christian there are some things we do just because we should do them. You know, it's, it's a whole lot more fun when the things you do, you do them because they're your delight. It's a whole lot more fun to live life that way. But the truth is, the truth be told, is that there are times in life that there are some things you do and you should do just for that reason, because you should do them. There are some times in life you don't feel like doing the things you should do. Uh, there are some times in life it's not necessarily a thrill or a joy to do the things that you should do. But if you are committed to the cause of Christ and if you understand the importance of that word duty, D-U-T-Y, and how the Lord says that we are to, it's our duty to serve the Lord, uh, if you'll do things because you should do them, they'll eventually become your delight. Uh, let, let's take, for example, soul winning. There's a lot of folks, what, what is soul winning? It's telling other people about Jesus Christ. There are a lot of folks, they'll pray and pray and pray for a burden. And they'll say, Lord, give me a burden for souls. Lord, give me a burden for souls. And guess what? Some days you'll have a burden. But other days, your bills are due and your health is bad and, and you've got your own troubles and your own problems and your own cares and your own worries. And if you're not careful, you'll be an on-again, off-again Christian. You'll do things just when you feel like doing them. But listen, if we'll instead do things because we ought to, what ends up happening invariably is it becomes your delight. Uh, if, you, if you do the things you should do, faithfulness is its own reward sometimes. Uh, some days you wake up, you don't feel like reading the Bible. You know, you just, you don't feel like it. You, you feel like doing something else. You know what you ought to do anyway? You ought to read your Bible. Uh, some days you wake up, you don't feel like going to church. Uh, that bed is warm, that floor is cold. Uh, what should you do anyway? You should go to church. And, and don't you, aren't you always feeling better when you leave? You've seen God's people, you've heard the Word of God, you've been able to touch somebody else's life. And uh, it's important that we learn to do things that are our duty to do. We ought to do things because... Uh, we are committed to the cause of Jesus Christ. Tonight, because it is also still uh, uh, Veterans Day, it is Veterans Day today, I want to talk about this subject tonight. The message is this, directives to soldiers of Christ. Directives to soldiers of Christ. The Bible likens us to a whole lot of things. It, it, it likens us as believers to farmers, people who plant the seed of the Word of God. And we water it and we, we wait with patience and watch it grow. Uh, the Bible uh, refers to us as builders with the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. But one of the things the Bible says we are, it says we are soldiers of Jesus Christ. When you got saved, you became part of the family of God, but you also enlisted in the army of God. And uh, some people say, no, it's the navy of God. Whatever it is, you got enlisted in God's service. 2 Timothy chapter 2 is written to a young pastor named Timothy, and the charges given in these verses are military charges. They're commands given from the Apostle Paul to this young pastor Timothy, but they apply to every one of us as soldiers of Jesus Christ. Look what Paul writes to Timothy, this young pastor. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The, that, the Bible says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him, to be a soldier. Lord, I pray that you'll fill me with your spirit. God, speak to our hearts through your word tonight. Help us, Lord, to understand that we are enlisted in your army, that we have a purpose here. Lord, this world's not our home. We're just passing through. Lord, we're on a campaign. We're on a mission from you. Help us to understand that and keep that in view. Lord, bless your word to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Five directives we can see to soldiers, to soldiers of Jesus Christ. In this passage, what's the first directive God says to his children, to his soldiers? Notice the first one, 2 Timothy 2, 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
What should we do as soldiers of Christ? Number one, we should be strong. We should be strong. Uh, it, what, that's, of course, the opposite of being a weak Christian. It's the opposite of, of being a, what old-time preachers used to call a milk-toast Christian, one that just goes with the flow, or what Revelation calls a lukewarm Christian. What's a lukewarm Christian? It's a little bit of hot, it's a little bit of cold, it's a whole, but, a whole bunch of nothing. It's like the savorless salt Jesus talked about. He said if salt loses its savor, he said, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. If you took the salt shaker, I like salt personally. I like a little bit of salt. In fact, as a kid, I was a little bit, I don't, some of you may have been this way. Some people liked a spoonful of sugar. I liked, and I'm not encouraging the kids to do this, but I liked a spoonful of salt. <laughs> I would take salt and I'd pour it in my hand. I like to lick that salt. I like the taste of it. I don't know, it's weird, I know, but I like the taste of it. But imagine grabbing that salt shaker and sprinkling it on your food, and imagine the salt has absolutely no flavor. It's just like gritty sand on your food. What would you do with that food? You'd probably just throw it out, or you'd take that salt and throw it outside just to maybe fill in some mud holes or something. That's what Jesus said about Christianity that's lost its savor, Christianity that's not strong, Christianity that's weak. He said it's like savorless salt that's good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. By the way, that's why the world walks over Christianity a lot is because there's a lot of savorless Christians. We must be strong as Christians. We must be different from the world. The Bible tells us how to be strong, and the Bible tells us how we should dress as soldiers of Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. It tells us to put on the armor of God. Look at Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. If we're going to be strong, we have to put on the armor of God. I mean, you're, if you're going to go to battle every day spiritually, you better have the right armor on. Notice all the armor that we're supposed to have. And by the way, you're supposed to have all the armor. If I say, hey, I'm going to have the breastplate of righteousness, but I'm going to neglect the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, will be, you be a very effective soldier for Christ? No. I mean, just imagine a soldier out on the battlefield. Imagine he's got his bullet, what is it, a flak jacket, is that what they call it in the army too? If it's a bulletproof vest, and he's got his helmet, and he's got his gun, and he's out there in the field in bare feet. How good do you think that soldier's going to be out on the battlefield? He's not going to be very good at all. Why? Because he needs every part of the armor. He needs to put on the whole armor of God. He shouldn't pick and choose parts he wants to wear. He should put the whole thing on. And Ephesians 6.10 reminds us, it says, finally, my brethren, what are the next two words? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles? Those are the tricks. Satan is wily. He's crafty. He's tricky. He's been doing this a long time. He knows how to destroy homes and families and believers and churches, and he'll, he'll ply his trade to try to destroy God's people. So we need to be aware of his tricks, first of all. We need to be aware of the fact that he will use these things. But then we need to put on the whole armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your problem isn't with your neighbor. It's not with the boss. It's not with your spouse, your children. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Where are you going to find the truth? In the word of God. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness which comes from Christ, but the righteousness from following after Jesus Christ as well. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, having something that guards your heart. Verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, advancing the cause of Christ, being ready any time to give the answer to any man that asks you a reason of the hope that's in you. Telling other people about Jesus Christ. Verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation. Yes, be saved, but know you're saved. Hey, if you are doubting your own salvation, you're not going to be very effective for the cause of Jesus Christ. Somebody asked, actually it was R.A. Torrey. They asked R.A. Torrey, what do you think the secret to D.L. Moody? Why did, was D.L. Moody able to reach over one million people for Jesus Christ in his lifetime? And he gave a list of seven things. But one of those things he said was this. D.L. Moody knew without a doubt that he was saved. Without a doubt. 
You know, if you know for sure you're on your way to heaven, uh, you're, you can be much more effective for Jesus Christ. If you're having your own doubts, you need to get that settled. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You know what perseverance means? It means you don't give up. You don't quit praying. Say, hey, hey, I've been praying for so-and-so to get saved. I prayed for him five times. Why don't you pray for him 5,000 times? Hey, I prayed for so-and-so. They're away from God. I just don't know if anything's ever going to get through. How about you persevere in prayer and you just keep praying and you just keep praying and keep bringing it to God? We want a fast food prayer. We want a drive through mentality with God. We want to be able to pull up and say, God, here's my order. And God says, here it is. But listen, sometimes you need to persevere in prayer. Sometimes you need to keep people in prayer on a regular basis. I encourage you to get a list of your family members and go through that list. We're about to come to the holiday season. I mean, we would think we're in it right now. You look at the ads, you look at the decorations all around you. But we're about to come to that season, and you're going to see family members you won't see any other time of year. You're going you're to be around people you won't be around any other time of year. I encourage you, I challenge you, get a list of your family and see, are they saved? Find out. And if they're not, make a list and just start praying for them to get saved and work at giving them the gospel. What does he say? Verse 8, pray, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. What's the first directive to a soldier of Christ? He says, be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Be strong. We ought to be strong Christians. We ought to be strong Christians. Number two, what's the second directive he gives? Look back in 2 Timothy 2. Verse 1, he said, Thou therefore, 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, directives he's giving to a soldier of Christ. He says, My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Notice next what he says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses... The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Number two, be faithful. Be faithful. How was it that Paul could commit things to Timothy? I'll tell you why Paul could commit things to Timothy. Because Timothy was faithful. Timothy was faithful. What does faithful mean? It literally means trustworthy. Can God trust you with his most important riches? What are God's most important riches? The souls of men and women, boys and girls, people. Can God trust you to be faithful? Hey, listen, let, let me just be very plain about this with church. Uh, it's important. I praise the Lord. I really do. I'm, I'm, it's amazing what God's done, how God has touched uh, hearts and, and people are faithfully serving the Lord here. But I'm going to tell you, that, that it, believe it or not, we have more faithful servants now than we've ever had. Praise God for that. People who are faithfully serving the Lord. But there, were, there was a day, there was a time when you didn't know who would be here or who wouldn't be here. You, wouldn't, you didn't know. So it's like, hey, let, we're going to have this event. We're going to do this. But, boy, I don't know if so-and-so will be there or not. I don't know. I know they signed up to come, but I'm not sure if they'll be there. See, faithfulness is so important. Faithfulness is important because you have to be able to be counted on by the Lord. Uh, imagine, you know, the Bible says we're like a body as a church. We're like the body of Christ. We all have a different function. Some, some person's the foot, some person's the hand. Say, which one am I? I have no idea, and I don't know. But we're all serving a different function for the cause of Jesus Christ. But just imagine one day, just imagine, you woke up and your right arm was missing. I mean, it just was missing. But then the next day, it was back again. <laughs> And then the next day you woke up and your left leg was gone. I mean, it was just gone. You, couldn't, you didn't know where, what happened to it. And the next day it was there again. It'd be awful hard to plan life, wouldn't it? <laughs> if you woke up every day not knowing which part would be there and which part wouldn't be there. Listen, to be, to be used of God in any capacity, in any place, and it's not just in the work of Jesus Christ as a soldier of Christ. It's in your job. It's, it's in your marriage. It's in rearing your kids. It's in school. If you're not faithful... You'll miss out on the blessings, and, and you won't be able to be used by the Lord. Hey, imagine if you went to school and just hit and miss. You wouldn't learn a whole lot of, a whole lot of things. We must learn to be faithful, to be trustworthy. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. What's a steward? A steward is someone who takes care of something that belongs to somebody else. 
You know, this church doesn't belong to any of us. You know who it belongs to? It belongs to Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Can Jesus Christ count on you? Can Jesus Christ count on you? to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. We ought to be faithful. We ought to be faithful in our ministries, in our marriages, in our homes. Uh, we ought to be faithful. Paul said to Timothy, be strong. Next, be faithful. Number three, the third directive to a soldier of Christ, teach others. Teach others. Hey, it's important for us to be faithful. But now listen, this next step takes a little bit of, it takes a lot of work, really. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's important that we make sure we're faithful, but then God wants you, here's what God wants you to do. He wants you to take whatever he's trained you to do, and he wants you to teach somebody else. See, there's something you know, there's something you can do that nobody else can, and you need to take what you know and invest in somebody else. There's somebody here at church that God wants you to take under your wing. And invest in. That's why I'm excited about this new Sunday school class. Because I, I believe that will be a tool to help us do that. But not just a Sunday school class. We can't all just say, well, Brother Buster's going to teach all the new folks, so I don't need to do anything. Praise the Lord. Thanks, Brother Buster. No, what we need to do is say, you know what, there are people that I could teach. That I could teach. Uh, may, maybe it's, when I, was, when I was a teen, let me back up. When I was a teenager, our youth pastor, you know, he taught us, he taught us the simplest things. He taught us how to sweep a floor. Say, so why does that matter? Well, if you've never had to do it before, you might not know the right way. He taught us how to sweep a bus. Little things like that. Hey, these young people running around here, if you're around them, take time to teach them some things. I mean, teach them. Teach them. Invest in their lives. Isaiah 28.10 says this, Precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You know how we grow as Christians? Here a little, there a little. What we expect is we expect a brand new believer to act like somebody who's been saved for 20 years. It doesn't work that way. How does it work? Here a little, there a little. Here a little, there a little. Which, by the way, is why church is so important. Why being in God's house is so important. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. Let's turn and look at it very briefly. The Great Commission Jesus gave to us before he went back to heaven. The words he gave us that we're supposed to fulfill, notice what it says, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's getting them saved. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's helping them to take that first step in obedience. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's an ongoing process. You know, we ought to always be learning from the Lord Jesus Christ, but then we also always ought to be teaching somebody else. Always teaching. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 20, you'll find the story of Saul. Who was Saul, and God sent Ananias to Saul and said, Go, put your hands upon that man, tell him the truth about me. He's a chosen vessel unto me. And the Bible says Saul spent a lot of time with the disciples. You know what they were doing? No doubt. They were teaching him. They were teaching him the word of God. They were helping him to see the truth. We ought to be teaching others. What did Paul say to the soldiers? Look back in 2 Timothy chapter 2, directives to soldiers of Christ. He said, number one, be strong. Number two, be faithful. Number three, teach others. Teach others. You have something to give. You have something you can teach that nobody else can. Teach others, number four. And this is an important one. This is so important because if you don't do number four, you won't be able to do the other three. Number four, endure hardness. Endure hardness. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. The Bible says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I, I like to read war stories. I like to read books about World War II and World War I and all kinds of, uh, of conflicts. And, and I like to read about the beginning. I read the book about the beginning of the Delta Force. And I just like to read books like that. And it's amazing. It's amazing what kind of hardness these people have to go through. I mean, live, being out in the elements, going without food, going without basic comforts of life, uh, suffering for days on end. Doesn't sound appealing, but listen, as a child of God and as a Christian, there are times we have to endure hardness. I mean, life won't always be a bed of roses. And if we only serve God when it is, we're going to be hit and miss all the time. 
We won't be strong. We won't be faithful. We won't be able to teach other people if we don't endure hardness. What, what, what kind of hardness should we endure? Well, a couple of kinds. First of all, discipline. God will discipline us sometimes. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look at it very quickly. Hebrews chapter 12. And I hope you'll go read this later on. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. There are some things in life that aren't wrong, but they still hinder you from being everything you can be for Jesus Christ. They're not sin in and of themselves, but they're not the best God has planned for you. Lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin." What is he saying in verse 4? When there's a real knockdown, drag out fight, you know what happens? It gets bloody. What he's saying is you haven't fought that hard yet against sin. He said you've dabbled at trying to fight against it, but you haven't gotten serious, he's t saying to these folks here. He says, listen, before you give up and in your mind, before you faint, think about what Jesus went through. Think about the fact that Jesus went to the cross and suffered all those things. What is Paul saying? He's saying you can endure some hardness. By the way, we don't, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, but I think Paul did. I'm not sure who did. Nobody is sure who did, but I think Paul did. But notice what it says. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, verse 5, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Hey, let's just be honest. Have you ever gotten to the place where you come and you hear another message, or you read your Bible again, or you hear another lesson, and you just feel like God's beating you up? You just feel like, boy, here's another thing i got to work on. But I was working on this for a while, and I thought I was doing good. And I was working on this for a while, and I thought I was doing good. And boy, I just feel like I, I just can't do anything right. How many of you have been there before? Yeah, I've, I've been there before. And you go, well, I just can't do anything right. I think God's just mad at me. Well, you know what? God's not mad at you. God's crazy about you. God loves you. He, he gave his son for you. But because he loves us so much, he sees great things in us. He does. He sees, he, he sees a masterpiece. And you know what, you know what an a artist does when he takes a block of stone? What does he do? He takes that hard hammer and that hard chisel. And when he sees a rough spot, what does he do? He knocks it off. And then he knocks off another piece and another piece and another piece until it's exactly what he's trying to make. And that's what God does with us when, when we... When God corrects us again, when we hear something again from the Word of God and, and we say, Lord, I, 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 boy, God, I need to work on that too, you can take it one of two ways. You can take it as, boy, God's mad at me again. He's picking on me again, but he's not. Or you can say, and this is what Paul's encouraging, or this writer in Hebrews is encouraging, look what he says. Verse 15, he says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him for whom the Lord loveth. He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Look down in verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. What is God saying? Whenever God tries to correct us or God brings something into our path, it's always out of love for us. We need, if listen, if we're going to be strong, if we're going to be faithful, if we're going to be able to teach others, we have to be able to endure hardness. And sometimes that hardness is discipline. What other kind of hardness should we endure? We just need to endure sometimes testings. Look at 1 Peter. 
Some things are not disciplined. They're just things that are out of our control. God allows them into our lives. Although I think about, you know, when, when I go through a, what I think is a tough time, I think about these believers in 1 Peter. These believers in 1 Peter chapter 1 were literally, I'm not speaking in a figure of speech here, these believers, many of them were literally being tied to a stake and put in the back of Nero's gardens and lit on fire. I'm talking about the believers because of their stand for Jesus Christ. By the way, I don't understand anything about that. I've never faced that kind of persecution. But there are believers all over the world going through that kind of persecution. But notice what Peter says even to those type of believers. 1 Peter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered. Why were they scattered? Because of the persecution. Scattered throughout, and he lists all these areas. Verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. He's speaking to Jews, and so he's speaking about the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season... If need be, by the way, that's what we have to remember when we go through a tough time. Those three words, for a season, for a season. Uh, you know the, the phrase, it came to pass. The fact is that every, everything that we go through eventually comes to pass. It will pass. What does it say? For a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Notice this, these believers, they were tried by fire. We, when we say we're tried by fire, we're speaking figuratively. Tried through difficult circumstances, tried through tough times. These believers were literally tried by fire. And Paul said, or Peter said, listen, the trial of your faith, that trial you're going through, that hardness you're going through, it's much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I've said this two or three times in the last week or two, but it's absolutely true. It's not a trite statement. It's a, totally, it's a true statement. When you go through a tough time, you either become bitter or you become better, one of the two. You have to choose. You know, we sang tonight, count your many blessings. Count your many blessings. I, I, I'm, I, can, I can be as negative as the next person. I can. I can, you know, I can focus on my troubles. I can focus on my problems. And I can, I can gripe and complain against the Lord. And I, I can do that. But you know what? It's a better thing to choose to say, you know what? God's been really good to me. I was lost on my way to hell, but Jesus saved my soul. I'm forgiven. I'm, I'm, I'm a child of God. I've got the Word of God. God's been good to us. To rejoice is a choice. You have to choose to rejoice. You have to choose to endure that difficulty. Look what Paul said, Philippians chapter 4. Paul wrote this out of prison. Again, don't just read the Bible, live the Bible. Put yourself in Paul's place for a moment. He's in prison. Why is he in prison? Because he's been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at Philippians 4, verse 11. What does he say? Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. What does that mean, I have learned? It means he didn't know how to do this before. He so said, I've learned something. Well, I didn't know how before, but now I know how. I've learned. What have you learned, Paul? In whatsoever state I am. Now, you mean Indiana or Kentucky or Michigan? No. In, in whatever state I am, whether I be rich, whether I be poor, whether I be healthy or unhealthy, whether uh, life be carefree or burdensome, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul, how do you learn to be content in any state you're in? How do you learn that? 
That's, that's not something that's natural. We, we don't, we're not just naturally that way. We don't just naturally have patience with tough situations. Paul said, no, I've learned, though, through going through these tough things, to be content, verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. By the way, how can you know those things without ever going through them? You can't. How, how can you identify with somebody who's struggling if you've never struggled? How can you identify with somebody who's lo- who is, uh, has lost something if you've never lost anything? How, how, how can you identify with somebody who's burdened if you've never had burdens? You know, the fact is, God allows us to go through a being abased and abounding. Notice what Paul said, I know both how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You know, we quote that verse, and we should. That's a great verse. We use it, we use it uh, and apply it to a lot of areas. But in context, what is it talking about? It's talking about going through hardship, going through difficulty. Paul said, I can do all things. Uh, that statement is absolutely true, though we may not want to admit it. It is true. God never puts on us what? more than we can bear. You know, he doesn't. He doesn't put on us more than his strength and his grace will allow us to, get, to, to bring us through. He says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If we're going to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, number one, we should be strong. Number two, be faithful. Number three, teach others. Number four, endure hardness. It's so important to endure. Last of all, number five, and this is, this is the end game. This is why we need to be strong. This is why we need to be faithful. This is why we need to teach others. This is why we need to endure hardness. Why? Number five, last of all, engage the enemy. Engage the enemy. Look at 2 Timothy again, chapter 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Is, is there a purpose for being strong? Is there a purpose for being faithful? Is there a purpose for teaching other people? Is there a purpose for putting up with hardship? There absolutely is. Say, what's the purpose? The purpose is this. It's the main purpose God left us here for. See, this life, this life where we endure hardness, where we have struggles, this life is so temporary. And it's so short. Eternity is forever. And every soul you see, every person you work with, every relative you have, every person who rides our bus, every person who walks in a service here Sunday morning, their soul is going to spend eternity one of two places. Either in heaven forever or in hell for all eternity. That's the reality. That's the reality. The reality is when, while we can get distracted with the affairs of this life, every person we come in contact with is going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. So there's an end game. There's a reason why we should be strong. There's a reason why we should stay faithful. There's a reason why we should teach other people. There's a reason why we should endure hardness. What is it? It's so we can engage the enemy. Who's the enemy? It's Satan. What does Satan want to do? Satan wants to send every soul to hell that he can. Satan wants every boy and girl. Satan, You know what Satan wants Sunday morning when these uh, kids ride the bus and they come to church? Satan wants to distract them. Have you ever noticed that? Boy, I've noticed, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've noticed this in soul winning. You'll be at somebody's house and showing them how to be saved. And even with a soul winning partner there trying to run interference, and you get to that part about trusting Christ, and all of a sudden the dog gets out of the yard and runs down the street. And all of a sudden the mailman comes, and the neighbor next door just has to talk right then and there. And they just interrupt, and the phone rings, and it's got to be answered. I can't tell you how many times I've seen it in church. I've seen it in church numbers of times where the invitation's about to be given and all of a sudden somebody feels led. They, they've been sitting for 35 minutes and they can't wait two more. They're going to get up and they're going to walk the whole length of the aisle and everybody just watches them go out. I can't tell you how many times that happens. Why? Why? Am I faulting those people? No, what I'm telling you is there's a real battle. There's a real spiritual warfare. Satan does everything he can to destroy and, and deceive lost men and women, boys and girls. And if we're going to be soldiers of Jesus Christ, what do we need to do? Number five, we need to engage the enemy. How do we engage the enemy? By literally pushing back the very gates of hell, getting people saved. Look at 2 Timothy 2 verse 4. The Bible says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him 
who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Imagine that you're a soldier out on a battlefield, and it's time. I mean, the, the, you can see the whites of their eyes, and they're coming. And the commanding officer says, let's go forward, march, attack. You go, wait a minute, though, my golf game's waiting over here. i got a golf game to go to right now. Hey, I gotta go. I gotta go take care of this, or I gotta go take care of that. No, wait. You're in a war. There's nothing more important. The Bible says, "No man that warreth, no soldier that warreth, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life." Why? So he can please him who's chosen him to be a soldier. We should engage the enemy. We shouldn't be entangled with the enemy or enamored with the enemy. First John two fifteen through seventeen. A lot of Christians are enamored with the enemy. They're, they're getting tangled up in the world, and they're becoming ineffective in the cause of Christ. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the, pride of, uh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passeth away. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Engage the enemy. Look at 2 Corinthians. We're done with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verses 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. The Bible is, oh, I'm in 2 Corinthians 3. Let me get to 2 Corinthians 10. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What strongholds? Homes, lives, wrecked, ruined by sin, lost, on their way to hell. God has given us the opportunity to reach into those homes, to reach into those lives, and to bring the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Verse 5, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Directives to soldiers of Christ. Let's bow our heads, please. What are the directives to soldiers of Christ? Number one, be strong. Be strong. You know what we need? We need strong Christians. We need strong prayer warriors. We need strong students of the Word of God. We need strong soul winners. We need strong believers who live a holy life and please the Lord. We need to be strong Christians. What else do we need to be? We need to be faithful. We need to be faithful. God can use us if we'll be faithful. If we'll just be there, if we'll be trustworthy, God can use us in amazing ways. What do we need to do? We need to teach others. We need to enlist others. There's something God's taught you. You need to teach somebody else. Hey, it shouldn't just be a preacher preaching or a teacher teaching. Maybe God has called you to teach or God has called you to preach. But even if he hasn't, he has called you to teach somebody else. Maybe it's one-on-one. -on -one. He wants you to teach them how to follow Christ. Number four, so important, we need to endure hardness. Life won't always be easy. There will be tough times. But the Bible still says, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. What's the purpose of all those things? Why should we be strong? Why should we be faithful? Why should we teach others? Why should we endure hardness? Listen, because we need to engage the enemy. There's a real enemy who wants to drag souls to hell, wants to blind them and keep them in darkness. And God's allowed us, the church, to get the light of the glorious gospel out to a lost and dying world. Would you ask God to use you? Would you ask God to help you? Be faithful, be strong, teach others, endure hardness so you can engage the enemy. Hey, this week, God's going to bring someone across your path that needs to hear the gospel. This week, God might bring a police officer or an EM, EMT or a fireman across your path. And you know what? The Holy Spirit's probably going to move in your heart and say, Hey, why don't you invite them Sunday? And when they come Sunday, they're going to hear the gospel. Would you ask God to help you as a soldier of His in this world? Would you ask the Lord to help you be strong and please Him who's called you to be a soldier? Hi, everybody. This is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. 
The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect. We are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.